Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Simon, and I'm with 3D Universe. Welcome to episode 23 of 3D Universe Untethered. In this bi-weekly live stream series, we get to hear from people across different industries about the great things they're doing with digital fabrication. As always, you can find uh, all the recordings of these episodes, as well as lists of upcoming episodes at 3duniverseuntethered.com. And you can also get this as a podcast through any of the major podcast platforms. So if you're on the go, you can just get the audio version on any of your preferred podcast platforms. If you're watching today on Facebook Live, please join into this conversation by posting comments on the live page there. We're going to try to keep an eye on those, uh, and we'll try to address any questions that come up before we wrap up later on. In today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at 3D printed ceramics in art and education. So I'm pleased to welcome our guests, Tamia Tahanyi and Abiam Alvarez, two artists and educators who are using ceramic 3D printing in their artwork and teaching activities. Tamia and Abiam, if you want to join me on screen. Welcome. Hey, everyone. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Abiam. So if you guys don't mind, just for our audience, I'm going to go ahead and read through a little bio on each one of you, just so we can learn a little bit more about your background, kind of set the context for the discussion here. So i uh, going to put each of you on the spot just for a minute here while I go through that. So I'm going to start with you, Abiam. Abiam Alvarez grew up in León, Guanajuato, Mexico for nine years before migrating to the United States in 1999 and settling in the small California town named Fireball, which is a farming community town surrounded by many fields of crops. Abiam experienced some of the labors through the agriculturally related jobs available in the summers as he grew up and attended school. After graduating high school, Abiam attended California State University Fresno from 2005 till 2011, where he earned his bachelor's degree in art and design with an emphasis in ceramics and sculpture. He later went back to college to earn a single subject teaching credential in the art to be able to teach high school art. His summers were still spent working laborious occupations in the Central Valley as he attended college. Abiam is a first-generation college student in his family. He currently resides in the Bay Area as a, as a ceramics and art high school teacher at Sobrato High School in Morgan Hill. His roots are closely tied to the Central Valley, where he grew up and makes work that speaks of the labors and political issues surrounding agriculture, sorry, agriculture, consumerism, and immigrant workers while working on his MFA degree at San Jose State University. Abiam has been working with ceramics since 2005. Abiam, welcome. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate that intro. Yeah, yeah. Really fascinating history. I was really, uh, really enjoyed reading that. It's just, and we'll talk more about this uh, a little bit later on, just how it's, it, I'm trying to wrap my head around, like, you did not have the kind of opportunities that a lot of us, you know, grew up with. And right. I'd love to hear more about how to kind of you made your way into this path and have managed to, to get into this advanced technical uh, educational field is wonderful that, that you've uh, been able to, to achieve everything that you have. Um, Tamia, I want to go through a similar bio for you. Tamia Tahanyi is a Hungarian-born interdisciplinary visual artist and ceramist living and working in Seattle, Washington. Tahanyi holds a Doctor of Medicine degree from Semmelweis University, Budapest, Hungary, a B BFA in ceramics from the Massachusetts College of Art in Boston, and an MFA in ceramics from the University of Washington. Tahan Yi's work has been exhibited in the United States, Brazil, Australia, Denmark, Spain, and the Netherlands, including Shepparton Art Museum, Henry Art Gallery, Bellevue Art Museum, Mint Museum of Art and Design, Society for Contemporary Craft in Pittsburgh, Clay Center for the Arts and Sciences, Foundry Art Center, International Museum of Surgical Science, Sculpture Space in New York City, and the Museum of Glass Tacoma. Wow. <laughs> she has received many recognitions, including the 2018 Netty Award in Open Media, a 2018-19 Bergstrom Award, a New Foundation Travel Grant, 2020 Macmillan Fellowship, and 2021 City Artist Award. In Seattle, her work has been a, a part of numerous solo and group exhibitions at Gallery for Culture, uh, COCA, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, C-O-C-A, Consolidated Works, Seattle Art Museum Gallery, Davidson Contemporary, and Soil Gallery. Her work is represented by the Linda Hodges Gallery, Seattle. Her exhibition, Object Permanence, a collaboration with artist Syria Tour, will open January 2022 in the Bellevue Arts Museum. Tahanyi is a teaching professor in the Interdisciplinary Visual Arts Program at the University of Washington. She's also the founder and director of Slip Rabbit, the first techno-ceramic studio in the Pacific Northwest. 
This unique mentoring space, which uses ceramic 3D printing for experimentation and learning, is a research hub at the intersections of art, design, architecture, science, and engineering. So welcome to Mia. Boy, we have a powerhouse uh, couple of guests here tonight, don't we? This is fantastic. Uh, this is going to be such an interesting discussion. Both of you have such unique backgrounds and are approaching the same kind of technology in such different ways, but both applying it in, uh, among other things, in educational environments, which we happen to be very passionate about here at Through the Universe. We just love the idea of getting these fantastic and very powerful tools into the hands of uh, the younger generation and just seeing all the amazing things that they can do with it. So I really look forward to hearing about your experiences with that. So to start us off, I figure we should maybe start with the basics. I don't know if everyone watching or listening necessarily knows what we're even talking about. When we say 3D printed ceramics, what's that? So Abian, maybe we could start there and maybe you could tell us just a little bit of what is 3D printed ceramics? How does it work? What are we talking about here? Sure, I'll try my best uh, to explain it. But uh, yeah, compared to uh, you know regular plastic 3D printing, uh, 3D printing ceramics, you, you're actually using a, a clay body. Uh, I think the easiest way to explain is like you sort of have like a big sort of syringe looking, um, you know, tube filled with clay with the plunger. And then it's like that plunger is, you know, extruding out the clay through a nozzle, uh, usually bigger compared to nozzle sizes on, on the regular 3D printers. And then you have a, a, a platform that it's following the G code and you know just doing all the movements as the clay it's being extruded from from the big syringe uh, in order to create you know a vessel or sculpture. Um, so yeah, you're Wonderful. just clay uh, as the material instead of plastic. Yeah, so we're actually extruding clay here, and I gotta say, having you know done some experimenting and testing with this myself on some of the same ki kinds of equipment you guys are using. I found it so fascinating and, and really enjoyable just to watch the extrusion because, you know, you get these really thick layers and just to yeah. see how the clay moves as it's coming out. I don't know. I, I loved it. I just I think it's it's just so uh, almost hypnotic. So um, to me, anything to add in terms of the, the basics of, of what 3D printed ceramics is? Yeah, thanks. So uh, what I'd like to mention to people is that the, the piece is being built from the bottom up layer by layer. And that is, that's a very interesting process and not unlike in ceramics, there is a coil building process that uh, is a very basic hand building technique. That's the kind of the 101 of everybody starting out in ceramics. Uh, after the pinch pot, you will uh, roll out some coils and start to layer them one on top of each other and build the form. And that's a really great way of imagining how um, something can uh, will be built. And then when when we think about designs for for 3D printing or 3D printed ceramics, that's really also becomes a constraint so that we can think about what are those forms that are more successful or more interesting for that reason. Just wanted to also point out, it's just, it just happened really that uh, I just finished the print like literally five minutes before we went on air. So the printer is behind me and what ABM was oh. saying about the big syringe and the plunger, you can see that's it a, right behind that's me. That's a and, and big the print, print there too. And the piece is standing right there. So I'm gonna yeah. take it off when-, when That's a large there. one, wow. All right. Well, we're going to come back. We're going to talk more about that. But that's a wonderful description that you gave. I really love how you how you talked about that coil method. That's a great way to think about the 3D printing. So that's exactly what it's doing. So um, let's talk a little bit about how each of you first learned about 3D printed ceramics and how you got started with it. So um, again, I'm going to start with you, ABM. How, how did you first, I, I know that you have, in your bio, it said that you've been doing ceramics since 2005. At what point did you learn about 3D printed ceramics and how did that come about? So I have been following 3D printing technology for a while. You know, there's like Instagram, Facebook, and also uh, the NSICA conference, which is a big ceramics conference that I think a lot of ceramicists know about. And it happens yearly at a different state. Uh, so going to NSICA conferences, you see like the booths and uh, they have vendors displaying their, you know, their stuff. So you see 3D printers there. Um, 
so yeah, I kind of just like started learning from there. I also, uh, last year is when I uh, first got a 3D printer. Um, you know, like we had the budget at our school. So I went, went ahead and bought one and I just kind of like taught myself how to, how to use it. Uh, but basically uh, I just learned about clay 3D printing by um, social media and also by mm. from Encica and the vendors that are usually there to display their, um, their stuff. And how, and how did you first get to be able to work with it? Is this something that your school or the school that you were with already had, or did you actually? No, I, I pretty much taught myself, uh, you know, I think last year with the pandemic, you know, and, and kids working from home, uh, teachers working from home, I guess I had a little bit more free time. So uh, I went ahead and taught myself, you know, YouTube, look up videos. Um, the, the 3D printer I have, it's a 3D Potter. Uh, okay. so they also have a really good, like, uh, frequently asked questions, and they walk you they through do. the whole process of setting it up and uh, starting your first print. So it's Great. just following, following those directions and, you know, like I said, uh, YouTube and just kind of like uh, figuring things out also from trial and error. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're going to come back and talk a lot more about sort of how you're bringing that into the classroom and what you're doing with that a little bit later on. Uh, so to me, uh, uh, I'm really fascinated by your background. So as we talk about kind of how you found your way to 3D printed ceramics, I, I just can't help but wonder about this. I mean, you are a medical doctor, you're an artist, uh, a widely recognized and celebrated artist, a, an educator. I mean, this is a really amazing combination. What an interesting background. So tell me, how, how did this all come about and how did you end up on, on this path and in getting into 3D printed ceramics? So I've been doing ceramics since uh, 1993 when I came to the US from Hungary and with a medical degree, I, I thought ceramics is just going to be a hobby and then it became a life passion. So I kind of stitched uh. that because of that. But I'm a very, um, I'm a ceramic sculptor working with uh, slip casting and other very industrial processes. So it wasn't so far for me to jump into using technology, but I do want to say that I'm completely self-taught and I started doing ceramic 3D printing um, in my own studio. So I found this slip rabbit five years ago and there wasn't a lot of information about ceramic printing and the very first printers were just being made around that time and being marketed just around that time. So there wasn't a lot of information. I wasn't really that much social media or, or anything that, that I, could, I could go to people uh, for information. So I was really sort of like figuring things out as I went. But I just want to just maybe mention one more thing that, that really helped me. Um, there are ceramic research centers around the world. And the European Ceramic Work Center in the Netherlands is one famous one. And they had a, a digital lab uh, that they set up about um, more than 10 years ago. So I, I don't know for sure, but about 10 years ago. And I was a resident there right around the time when they were setting it up. And I was curious, um, but I was stayed away from the the equipment and I didn't use that at a time. But later on, I was collaborating with mathematicians and it really made sense to try to follow the exactness of their sort of like thinking process and their discipline and try to be as exact as possible with what I was trying to make, which were sculptures, mathematical sculptures. And that's how I got into prototyping using a 3D printer at the, at the European Ceramic Work Center. It was a, a 3D printer with a very different mechanism. It was a, a powder printer okay. in which there are there is an adhesive that's being a layer, being deposited layer by layer onto a, a ceramic material in a dust form. So uh -huh. um, that made me feel like there is a use for me for this technology. And then when I came back, I researched, ordered my printer, got it in in a box put it together and I was very freaked out. I had no idea what I was doing, whether this is yeah. possible. And in, in a matter of a couple of months, I was able to, to make really interesting stuff with it. 
That's wonderful. And I, I had a, I have to say, I had a similar experience myself. I, I've done testing with the 3D Potter, their uh, Potterbot 9 Pro model. And um, it was very much like what ABM was saying and what you were saying to me that it's, it, you know, they have a great sort of frequently asked questions on their website. They have some, some good documentation and, and links to get you started. And that was pretty much all I, I needed. I mean, it wasn't, I can't say it was as quick and easy as taking a traditional 3D printer out of the box and, you know, setting it up, there's a little bit more of, you know, to the calibration and to the setup, but I, I, I didn't have a hard time and I had no background in uh, working with uh, 3D printed ceramics at all. So um, yeah, it sounds like we had a similar experience in that regard. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little different, but they give you everything you need to, to get through it, you know, with, with some, with a little time and time and effort, right? So let's talk about um, the experience that you came from. And um, I, I, ABM, you mentioned this a little bit that when you were we were talking about sort of what 3D printed ceramics is, you compared it to sort of traditional 3D printing, FDM 3D printing, if you will, where you're extruding plastics. Um, so did you have a background with that the 3D printing, I think you said, before you got into the ceramic 3D printing, you had already done some regular 3D printing? No, it actually kind of happened at the same time. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, like I, I got, I think I got the clay 3D printer first, and then later on I got the FDM printer. Got so it. So you had just been kind of following since, it online yeah. and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. So, All it right. so then, simultaneously. and how about you, Tamia? Had you worked with regular FDM printers before? I mean, I know you mentioned the one that was powder based, but other than that, had you done any that deal with like thermoplastic filaments? No, I have not. And uh, I, okay. I got uh, an FDM printer, plastic printer for the studio about two years ago. So uh, I had gotcha. okay. ceramic printers first and then the plastic printer. Got it. Okay. Well, I'll just say, I guess, as the one here that had a, a lot more of a background with regular FDM printing and then getting into ceramic uh, 3D printing, what I will say is there's a lot in common. I mean, at the end of the day, you're working with G-code. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's still G-code. You're still using the same same kind of slicing software. Uh, the differences are really just in setting up the hardware and the way you load the clay and the way you calibrate the, the height of the nozzle and all that. And, and otherwise, I, I think most people that have done any 3D printing would find the overall workflow pretty familiar, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. That, that's correct. I also want to say that I feel like with ceramics, there's a lot more flexibility. The, the scale is yes. bigger, the, the um, one can create parts or like in my case, I'm just basically creating just surfaces right now for like very textile like surfaces that can be then re rebuilt and reused in, in completely different forms. So it really has more of a range uh, for for use and purpose and also like as, as a kind of like as a driver of, of a creative process, I, I do enjoy the ceramic printing a lot more. Yeah, uh, with the, it, with the, yeah, with the with the plastic printing is usually what you see is what you get, and then you try to clean it up, and yeah, maybe exactly color. Yeah, so I, I we talked about this a little bit um, uh, in an in an earlier discussion that the material itself introduces some interesting variables, right? I mean, this is a soft material that you know can can move and droop and hang and fold in ways that plastic wouldn't, and yeah, that opens up some really interesting opportunities. We're going to get into that more when we look at some of your work in a moment here, Tamia, especially. But um, yeah, it's so it's. It, that's really interesting to me because I've always, one of the things whenever I talk to somebody about 3D printed ceramics, um, there's always been a discussion of sort of, uh, how do I say this? It's almost, there's almost a question of, does this take away the art, right, of ceramics now that you have a machine doing it for you? And and I, I think your work to me especially is such a wonderful example of, of how it really can be a tool for doing different kinds of art, but um, it, it certainly doesn't take away or eliminate the artfulness by any means. So you can see that clearly in your work. Can I, can um, I share a story? I was going to ask each of um, you. I'm sure you've run into this. So yeah, ABM, what, yeah, what, is, like, what are your thoughts like, on that? Like I had a, you know, I 3D printed a bunch of mugs. You know, they had like a interesting design on them. And then I posted it in a certain uh, clay group. And I just asked the question, like, why do people here think about 3D printing ceramics? So it's like my comments just blew up. And, you know, I was getting comments from both point of views, like some 
some uh, traditionalist artists were like, oh, that's not art at all. It's like, there's no soul in there. Uh, it's terrible, <laughs> this and that. And obviously there's also people who definitely um, liked it and they were uh, definitely supportive about it, but it, it got pretty- Yeah, uh, isn't that interesting? The different reactions you yeah. get um, yeah. to the Those same works. How about mm -hmm. you, Tamiya? Have you run into that kind of discussion? Oh yeah, I for the past five years, um, yes, I have had the discussion a lot, and I like to point out as uh, that the the history of ceramics is full of innovation of tools, and many of them are mechanical. And this is absolutely yeah. so. There is there is really no difference. There's I mean, even the wheel, right? The pottery yeah, wheel itself. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then there there are lots of. Um, sort of uh, authors, cultural critiques to write about this a lot and really analyze how every part of this digital process from the making of your model in the digital space, in the computer space, um, to the, the way that might be sliced and prepared for the 3D printer to the actual printing process and then everything else that you might do after, those are all like sources of craft. Those are all need the, the kind of skill and they need the innovation, they need the idea, they need the, to see the, the possibility. And I think like what we do in the studio is to try to see those possibilities at every single level, whether it's the making of the model or the altering the machine or the, the way we might be slicing or how it's going to be used. What is the data that we might use? We had a project where we use sound information um, that was fed then to the to a basic form um, in 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 Python, in, in a coding language, and then it created texture on the surface of, of the printed ceramics that was actually driving the code of the machine. So there's a lot of innovation that can happen. And of course, you know, somebody's just really focused on the clay and the hand might not see that or might dismiss right. that, but it's definitely there. Mm -hmm. I agree. That is that is a wonderful, and we're, I, I'm I'm anxious to get to look at some of your works too, and we're going to see some of that. I, you know, to me and your work, especially to me, your the, your background with kind of the combination of of mathematics and art is a really interesting intersection, and and you can see that so clearly in your work. So we'll we'll talk more about that when I have that on screen. Um, and I, I'll mention at the same time, by the way, we always try to keep these as much kind of discussion oriented as we can, because I know some people like to listen to 3D Universe Untethered as a podcast. This is one of those sessions that I, I think you'll get a lot out of listening to it, but you'll want to check out the video at some point because you got to see the work that these two have produced. It really is amazing. Uh, but we'll share the links to those sites as well, along with uh, the podcast and the recording. So let's let's talk a little bit about the, the the specifics, talk a little bit more about what you guys are working with, the tools, the hardware, the materials, things like that, before we get into looking at some of your actual projects. So I'll start with you, ABM. I think you mentioned that you're using a 3D Potter machine. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's a 3D Potter uh, 10 Pro. Oh, nice. Okay. So you have the 10 Pro. That's their, mm -hmm. I, I think that's their latest model, isn't it? That's, that's, that's their latest. latest generation. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and what's your, uh, what's your experience been with that, uh, with that unit so far? I know that's your uh, first one, but. Yeah, pretty good. So as far as like all other equipment I use, um, I have a, a, a Peter Pugger, which is a, a clay pugging machine and it has an okay. attachment uh, on it. So um, I attach it to the pug mill and then I, I insert the, the plastic tube and then the clay gets pushed into the tube so I could fill up the tubes and then you know, go through the whole setup. Uh, the cool thing about the, I guess the 10 Pros is that, I don't know if the nine, the nine still has like the little screen. Uh, the 10 Pro is uh, completely um, like Wi-Fi connected. So mm -hmm. like, it's really cool because I just get my phone and connect straight to the to the printer and then operate it from my phone. Exactly. Yeah, that is nice. That's, that's and, so and we should mention, so you mentioned the, the pug mill that you're using. And to me, I'm guessing you guys have one of those at the studio. For those that might be considering, you know, this kind of thing, I, you should mention you don't necessarily have to have one of those. It's wonderful. Yeah. I, you know, I have one of those wall mounted loaders. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, leverage based. And for me, if you're just loading one or two tubes at a time, that that works quite well. But you definitely want, want something like that to be able to load that clay into the tube with 
without yeah. getting air bubbles and that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, you, right? you could always, yeah, I know like uh, uh, 3D Potter they have also on their website, like you could just uh, fill it up by hand. And exactly. You know, yeah, keep if it, they've uh, got air, some good air instructions. Bubble, air bubble free as much as possible, but yeah, you could definitely, you don't need all the equipment. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and how about you, Tamiya? What is that that I see behind you there? Is that is that? Uh, this is a Potter by Seven. This is a Seven. Oh wow! Okay. A, a model from five years ago. This was the one that we used for setting up the the studio, um, and it still runs amazing. Oh yeah, I bet. I I, I well love made. it, and it's very reliable. Um, had to change a few parts over the years, but there sure. was never anything that that was major. And that uh -huh. we were able to resolve everything in in you know matter of days, um, but it still has the the LCD screen. It's just the whole thing. This the computer is built into it, so um, it's it's also great because I can take it to some other place and and use it. Of course. Uh, at the studio, we also have a Delta Wasp machine a 4100 so that's a, a very large machine um, that uh, prints up to um, three feet um, and is that also a clay extruding machine it is a, it is a clay extruder it works with a compressor so it's, oh, okay. a, little bit, it's, a, it's a little bit different machine and it's it's enormous it stands yeah. on the floor and the top of it goes up to almost to the ceiling um, it doesn't get as much use as the potter bud does because it's just simply more complicated to to load sure. and to clean out um, and then other things we have we have everything that a ceramic studio needs uh, uh, two kilns um, uh, glazing booth, uh, slip casting station, clay preparation. We do have a plug mill. I do have the uh, super duper clay extruder, which is the, a, a simpler way of filling up the tube. But for years, we've been uh, filling up tubes by hand and that was just fine. Okay, great. Good to know. Um, so I, I want to share my screen here and take a look at some of your projects just to because the work really speaks for itself in so many ways, but this is going to give us a lot to talk about. So give me a moment here to find the right screen. I'm going to start with you, ABM. Uh, let's see, there we are. So just talk to me about this. I've got some photos here. Uh, what are we looking at here? Is this this is your current, is this the, the 10 Pro that we're looking at? Yeah, yes, yes, it is. And that's in my classroom. Okay, so this is in your classroom, and what are the works that we're seeing sitting there? Are these things that your some of your students have, have done? Uh, those are things that I, I 3D printed myself, so I okay. the models, and yeah, those are just examples um, of different models created. Very nice. Did. Yeah, we didn't talk too much about this before, but one of the things that really is, um, to me, really nice about the 3D, it's funny, you know, with so many people that have a background in traditional 3D printing, they're always trying to get the layers as thin as possible <laughs> so they're invisible, so you can't see the layering. And with ceramic 3D printing, it's like you, you want the layers, you're, you're using these big nozzles with these big thick layers, and that that kind of brings out the character and the beauty to me. Right. I, I, I don't know if you, you see it that way too, but I love this. I, I love where you can where you can see that textured layered look yeah. i think it brings out such interesting uh and dimensions you could, you could smooth it out if you want to i personally don't care to i just like leave all those layers uh, visible there yeah i'm sure it depends on what you're trying to do but like you said so how would you do that if you wanted to do a smoother piece you would uh you would i would you sand it or how, how does that work so i guess once the print is done uh you would let the the clay uh set up a bit so it could um be more easily to manage and handle and then from there you you know select a tool or a sponge and then just try to smooth, just wipe it a little yeah smooth over all the all the little coils got it so that just depends on what kind of a look you're going for. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, too, the other way I think about it, sometimes the glaze itself is just going to uh, smooth over some of those layers. So, yeah, it's like I'm going to spend time to really smooth. You got some, you got some big pieces here. Yeah, right there. I was uh, just trying to uh, print as big, uh, I guess, like the overall height of the printer. So I think like the tallest one there at the center. Yep. It's like the... Oh. One of the things that I learned the hard way when I was starting to do some testing with the Potter bot is 
you have to really think about the weight of the, the clay as you're building yeah. up. And if, you might be able to do a 60 degree overhang on a regular FDM printer. You try doing that on a ceramics printer and mm-hmm. it's going to collapse on itself. Yes. And so you'll notice your very tall ones are, are very slim and don't, yeah. don't try to go out at extreme angles. Yeah, you definitely that, have that to consider that sense. when you're making the model, like uh, you can have too much of a, of a curve. Um, to make- yeah tanks because they may collapse but yeah these are great examples of things that would be i don't know how you could do this without a 3d printer you know Mm -hmm. yeah that's beautiful something that's really interesting with the ceramic printing that you can alter the pressure rate and even the speed Mm -hmm. of the movement that will give uh, uh, people different effects um, and uh, the different scales that uh, the same object could be Mm -hmm. printed at will also give you very different textural effects. Yeah. Um, that, that's just so much fun usually to experiment with. And then just one note on the, the kind of support um, that, that we've been observing here is that um, yes, you can do the 60 degree overhang, but um, you can, or like not, not in a way like you would be doing it on an FDM printer, with supports that in the ceramic printer um, that the supports that the slicer is able to create they are meaningless yeah, yeah, yeah. usually ruin the surface and they're not very helpful but every other way that is legitimate so we use foam we use chunks of clay we use every oh. every tool in the, the toolbox uh, to okay. support the work and it is usually successful if it if it's not successful i usually just print it in two pieces so uh-huh. that there is the 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 um kind of like the angle is happening right closer to the platform so it could be easier supported than than up high very smart very smart now here we have one that was uh Oh, let me back to the next one. This one is is glazed, and and what are we looking at here? Because it looks nice and smooth. Is that is that just because the glazing covers over all that layering? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's why I was saying, like, you know, I don't have to worry about uh, yeah. thinning it out too much because if I put on the glaze thick enough, the glaze itself is just gonna smooth over uh, all that texture. So yeah, like I was just mentioning, like, you know, with that previous one. Um, like uh, the original model was, you know, smaller in scale. And then when I put it like on a slicer, I like to play around with the slicer because you could uh, change the dimensions, you know, kind of like just stretch it out uh, or widen. And which which model are you talking about here? The, the, the one. The, this one in the tall the one, one there? Yeah, the tall one at the, at the left. Oh, okay. The one so that that's, the- you, that's one that you sort of stretched out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good that's, way to do it. Mm-hmm. So that's a fun thing to explore as well. You could just on the slicer itself, you could have, uh, yeah, that one, you could do a few modifications uh, on the skin sure. and play, play around with that. So now how are you, how are you creating these ABM? Are you, are you using CAD software? I mean, how are you actually creating the models for these? Yeah. So I use a uh, Fusion 360. Um, okay. Software, so I have a education education's license so it's free sure. for educators and students and how did you learn to do that part of it i mean these are pretty advanced designs you're creating here I, um, again I, I just taught myself as well i looked at youtube and you know like just play around with the program and just start creating models and you know like i said there were a couple of trial and error some models didn't really work out or, and yeah I, you know take some time out of my day and just you know make some models and Eventually, I'll learn a little bit more advanced moves. I can still say I'm, I'm a novice. You know, I'm nowhere near a uh, professional, but, you know, just playing around, you know, with the with different shapes and extrusions and twistings and all this and that on, on Fusion. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. That's it's, the it's, yeah, that's the it's great for, given that this is your first ceramic 3D printer, I mean, these mm-hmm. look really, really nice. Beautiful. Um, let me see here. I'm going to switch, uh, windows here and I want to look at a couple of your projects to me. I just got to find the right window. Bear with me. Is it, where is it? Too many windows. Ah, there it is. Okay. Share. 
Um, okay, are you, did I share the right window? Are you seeing the uh, uh, Slip is. Rabbit website now? Yep. Okay, excellent. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit first. I, I just learned about this actually minutes before this episode, and I was blown away. Tell me about what we're looking at here. This this is on the Slip Rabbit website. If you just click on book there at the top, what is this amazing resource that we're looking at here, Tamia? Right. So this is on, on the Slip Rabbit website. It's a book that I wrote um, during the pandemic, actually in the beginning of the pandemic, and that got published in uh, the spring of 2020. Uh, it's called Making and Breaking Rules. Um, and this is a sort of a, a journal on a couple of recent projects that I've been doing that are inspired by math or mathematical thinking, collaborations with mathematicians. So there is a little bit of math described in there. And I think that the readers or the listeners will find it extremely um, entertaining and useful. I think it's really uh, uh, like a, the fun part of math. Um, yeah. And then there is uh, there there are some of my musings about just thinking about interdisciplinary collaborations and and um, kind of like working in between disciplines, which I tend to do a lot. There is some some of my thoughts about digital practices in general. And then in mm -hmm. the the book has a section that's in color coded in pink, and that mm -hmm. section is just all like hands on like how to do 3D printing. So, so that's, yeah, that's the, ses the section that we're looking at. So the book is both available in print through um, the website, but it's also available as a free download chapter by chapter uh, from the website. So, that is amazing. I just, yeah. that you're, that's an amazing resource that you're making available there. And I, so head on over here, sliprabbit.org slash book. I mean, that that's if you're into ceramics 3D printing, this looks like something that you've got to check out. So I want to look at some projects. Now I'm going to flip over to a, your other website here where you've highlighted some of your work. And there is so much here, we wouldn't have time to go through everything. But I'd like you to maybe help direct me to some particular projects that we could talk about that that you know represent some of your work and some of the more interesting approaches that you've taken that that get to that intersection of that you were talking about of arts and architecture and math and all that, et cetera. So where would you like me to start here? As yeah, we look at some of this? Um, well, I'd like uh, you to go to Etelkus, which is the second one down in the sculpture menu. Got it. Okay. Oops, sorry. Clicked the wrong thing there. Okay, here we go. Oh, look at this. Yeah, this was one of my favorites. So, um, <laughs> thank you. So these are these are all uh, 3D printed porcelain uh, that are fired to uh, 2160 degrees fire, uh, Fahrenheit. Um, there is some color pigment on it, and the, many of these are made in several pieces. So, for example, this one that's in the foreground, which looks like a, um, uh, so, like carpet. a it looks like a carpet. Yeah, it's like a squished carpet, a oh, roll of I mean, it's carpet amazing. that someone would stand up and they would stand yeah. like as a cylinder, but then kind of like slump and collapse. Um, and it's very heavily patterned uh, with a texture that I develop in rhino, rhinoceros. Okay. And um, then it, it, it gets sliced and there is a very... Um, very calculated method that I work with. I have to say that that um, one when I had the idea of the of the, the patterning of the surface and that it became the the work that I um, I am now doing. I also reverse engineered the process and and kind of went from the from the from the slicing backwards to try to figure out how to make the print or how to make the patterns that they become extremely precise. So every, everything is very tightly controlled as far as the texture, texture goes. And the textures originate from traditional Hungarian folk textiles, which oh, I'm amazing. really interested in, in textiles and textile processes in general. Um, um, I take some designs from these um, pattern books but then I also digitally alter these designs and iterate on them. So they become 
a family of similar looking designs, which then I put on these cylindrical forms that uh, will get printed out. And after the printing, I alter them. So the alterations happens by, by gravity, by squishing it, by um, putting it in the kiln and then letting the, the really hot temperature also just continue to slump the vessel. So that's kind of my process with that. And, and that, that's the kind of work I'm working on right now for my exhibition at the Bellevue Art Museum as well. It really is, is striking, just an amazing technique. And I love how you've incorporated the, uh, the, the patterns that have come from your culture and environment and brought it into this new art form. It's just fantastic, really beautiful work. Is it colored, Tim, as a color from colored clay, or are you like uh, adding color afterwards? The color on these ones are added afterwards. I, I okay. also have been making pieces that, are, that uh, have the color in the porcelain, which is a really mm. beautiful way of yeah. going, of getting very saturated color, but it's yeah. like super expensive, and I don't want to expose oh, the yeah. students yeah. to you know, having having that material mm -hmm. in, in our, our on our surfaces and stuff. So, so mm -hmm. there is a certain precaution mm -hmm. that people need to take um, yep. with colored porcelain bodies. Yep, definitely. Excellent. Well, let's take a look at another one. What else should we jump to here? Yeah. So I think what would be nice to look at. Let me let me show you maybe like two things very very quickly. If you go to the mothering uh, series that says mothering and and glass and porcelain, this is a work that uh, these are sculptures that consist of a porcelain piece and the glass piece that corresponds to it. And they the the glass and the porcelain piece are kind of like in this relations physical relationship of being em embracing each other, but also kind of like strapped together, um, very passively. Um, the what what I sort of wanted the reason why I wanted to show these um, to point out that ceramics could also be a medium for um, for just a positive. So the process of these were that I made the ceramic form and I took molds of that and the the molds then be used at the um, Tacoma Glass Museum to blow glass mm. into that. So I could have an identical form in glass and then in a, and the same form in, in porcelain. And then we altered the glass forms by literally why the glass was hot, like squishing yeah. the two pieces together. So like, I just, the reason why I'm like, I wanted to point it out because sometimes people think like, oh, ceramics just need to be the finished medium but it, it works equally well as, as sort of like the, the transient medium, like, yeah. as, and that's something that you might take a mold of and then it will mm -hmm. become something um, else. So each yeah. of, in each of the forms, each of these sculptures, the, the glass form and the ceramic form came from an identical um, one. And then the glass was altered and uh, so I prefer to have like each medium kind of do what they do best. Yeah, you can see that. That is so unique, really creative approach. Thank you. And then maybe the other, if I could just sort of point out another example, uh, that would be, let me, let me just think. Uh, I think you might, well, let me just look at it quickly. I think you might want to go to interactions. Interactions. Oh, it's in the, oh, it's sorry, in the other here. menu. Yeah. Got it. Uh, and then down to listening cups. So Listening Cups was a collaboration with um, UX designer Audrey Desjardins. And um, Audrey is interested in IoT data and what happens to it, especially is like there's so much data that's being collected and it's unseen and un unnoticed and where does it go? And I was interested in using data for as, as, as a form giving tool. So we came together for this collaboration and created a series of cups. And the, the cup form is made in 
CAD in a very traditional way. It's, it's very simple. It doesn't have the texture. And then we added the, the sound information that was sound uh, volume recorded from various environmental soundscapes and added that data information and the data information controls the printer and the printer. so it's actually coming out farther where it's louder is that what this represents right, exactly and that and the printer is responding to the data information so that was something that um you know it just almost like happened as an accident that that i noticed something that the printer was doing and that gave me the idea of how that could be used um for something and then when our collaboration with audrey came about um we i suggested that we try this and it was it was remarkably successful we didn't yeah know that that this was what we were gonna get so, so yeah. clar clarify something for me, please. Is this something that's happening where you're recording this sound and translating it into the, the G code and slicing it into the printer? Or is this happening more in real time where as it's printing, it's translating sounds? That would be an amazing next step for us to do, but the, the, the machine has has limitations. So this is pre-recorded Of course. Sound. Yes. Okay, all right. So, so you're- that, that would be amazing, yes. That would so be you're it. selecting sounds and you're, so you're able to use these digital sound files to essentially translate that into geometry that then goes into yeah. the G-code. So, so, so G code is a set of numbers, basically coordinates, yeah. and and I mean it's a data set, and you can do anything with that data set, and basically that's what we did. We added. Oh, so you're that. not even you're skipping the middleman. You're not even generating 3D geometry. You're just generating the G code using the exactly. sound data. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So we generated the first uh, G code that's just the basic cup form that did Got not it. have any of the textures. And then the rest was basically done as, as just kind of like a data set. Oh, that's very smart. Very creative approach. Very creative approach. So you, I think you mentioned that you're using, you were using Python to do that data translation. It, it, it is, so it, it actually, it, it's a whole lot simpler. So I sometimes use Python and I'm like, I don't, I don't code. I work with other people that, that I can then ask of like, help me with this coding, but this is, this is done in Excel. This is how okay, simple wow. it is like as a table. And, oh, and great. We have a little video better. clip here. We can yes. show people what these actually look like when they're running. Let me run this. I won't let the whole thing go. I'm going to skip through here if you don't mind. I just want to get to a part where we're actually showing a ceramic 3D printer. There you go. Oh, I just I just love that. I find it so, so pleasing to watch. And even the sound of the printer is <laughs> very nice. Yeah. Oh, look, there you go. Doing one of those extra extrusions yeah. and again you can see how it just how it oozes that's so, it's so mm -hmm. wonderful how you get that extra variable from that material property oh and there you see this is so this is about that sound so we collected yeah so some of the the collection of the sound collection was actually in collecting in the studio using the printer printing uh, the the sound of its own noise um, so yeah, uh, there's a lot of possibilities here. That's great. That's great. Let's see. Oops. All right, there we go. Okay. Well, let's see, you know what, let's take a look at one more because there's just so much here and I'm going to invite people to go. We're going to share these links to all these sites for both of you. So people will be able to go and check out your work, but there's so much here. Uh, let's, let's take a look at one more that we can talk about here. So, so maybe, maybe uh, then I'd like to show something um, very different again, not, yeah. not a sculpture. Go back to um, interactions and on the very top, uh, there it says Ringato Cradled. Yes. So it's a... Um, it's a performance piece. It's basically mm -hmm. a dance, like a pot of dough with the machine. And oh, we wonderful. are, um, we present this at the studio uh, at our open houses um, and have people sit down in front of the printer and uh, reach out and have the nozzle print into their hands. So instead okay. of printing into the, onto the platform, the, the printer is printing into the hand and what it's printing is a sphere. So it wouldn't have even have a chance to be printed. 
everything on the platform. And oh. what happens is that it, the person really needs to move with the machine. It's very much, it's very meditative. It's very performative. It's very yes. dance-like. Um, and um, that everybody individually shapes the, the sphere and they, they look mm. uh, very different from one another. You can definitely that tell the type, very cool. the, the type A person from the type B person uh, from the result. Um, oh yeah! So each of the each of the products represents yeah. reflects the person that made it. Isn't that fascenating? I still Brilliant have to do that and do it with my students. Yeah, that would you be a great right. project for the classroom. Yeah. yeah, oh, kids would have so much fun with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, I could spend all day going through this stuff, but I have a couple of other uh, questions. And I definitely want to have some discussion about what we just got into there about the classroom. So let's switch gears here a little bit. Just each of you are kind of doing different things. Um, I know that you're primary focus uh, to me has been with Slip Rabbit in the studio, but you are now also uh, a professor and, 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 and teaching and, uh, and ABM, of course, you're, you've brought this 3D Potter into the classroom. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm going to, again, start with you, ABM. How, obviously, you've been teaching ceramics for, for a while, but now what have, what's happening with 3D printed ceramics? How are you bringing that into your classroom? What, how, how big of a part of your program is that? Just talk to us a little bit about what you're doing in with the students with this. Yeah, yeah. So um, I teach beginning ceramics, and then I also teach an advanced uh, ceramic section. So the 3D printer uh, and all the technology, I introduce it to the advanced students. Uh, this year, I have 14 of them. Uh, currently, what I'm having them do is first learn the software, so um, Fusion 360. Uh, mm -hmm. I had them first kind of like, you know, play around with it uh, more as a homework assignment and uh, had them create a die. So to create an extruder die. So a die is just kind of like a simple, um, you know, cube basically with some yeah dimples. you know it's about five millimeters thick mm -hmm. and you know create a shape uh so that that die then we uh put it on a extruder a handheld extruder in order to create a handle a handle for a mug uh oh i see i'm sorry i was thinking of a different kind of die i was thinking like yeah, dice. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an extruder die so it's a, got it okay think about it like a nozzle but you know it has a shape uh got it okay um, oh, I was going to ask about that. So that's how you're doing the handles on those mugs and that sort of thing, just basically extruding yeah. the clay through a different mm -hmm. shaped nozzle. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I started on with the basics because I think it's really easy to just go online and download a model. Uh, so I first want them to learn how to use the program. Eventually, later on, I'm going to have them create some type of vessel on Fusion 360 so that we could then um, print it in clay. Um, at the moment, they're learning uh, wheel throwing, and uh, they're kind of, it's weird because, uh, like, although, like, it's exciting, you know, because when I have the 3D printer going, they love seeing it, you know, just watching it do its thing. Uh, and now they're really focused on their pottery skills, uh, and, like, like, the whole 3D modeling, that's kind of more like, like a homework assignment, so I feel like kind of rejected a bit but i am getting some students you know that have already created their dies and then sort of like i think some of them are learning the program because yeah first learning the program does take a bit and you know i kind of like experiment with it and create different models uh, so eventually they'll be making um some 3d printer ceramics so the first thing they did was create that um it was uh, a die created with the fdm printer got it okay yeah. Excellent. It's it's always particularly nice when you can create something that actually gets 3D printed and is is an actual you know usable part that yeah. you can do something with. It's there's there's something very rewarding about that experience. So it's, it's great that you did that with them. Yeah. Um, so Tamia, let's let's talk about you a little bit. How are you bringing 3D printing ceramics into the educational um, environment? And I, I'm guessing it's different between the studio and the university work. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so Sleep Rabbit operates independently from the university. It's my, it's my own research studio, but also it's 
it's functioning as 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 a nonprofit, so that we could have artist residencies and internships and collaborations. So most of the uh, students that I have had here came as either interns or uh, were part of a research group. Um, they, um, I think, what might be different is that they are interested in they know that they're getting into ceramic printing but they don't come from a ceramics background or very often they don't come from an art background either a lot of hmm. my interesting EVM that you mentioned that your students are not really into the 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 kind of the CAD side of things because I noticed the same thing at the university the ceramic students really would like to do the hands-on the, yeah, the real prefer. working the hand building but there there is a and and the and I kind of like set up the studio to be interdisciplinary to like really uh, encompass a lot of different types of thinking processes and making processes. And I do have a lot of architecture students, design students, engineering students, computer science and math students, or like students from psychology and other places you're just really interested. And um, my rule is in the studio that everybody would have to learn a little bit about everything. So about the machine, about CAD, uh, if we are like, pro if our research has to do with coding, then everybody gets a little sense of coding. Um, we, we use microprocessors uh, for another project, research project. And then everybody needs to learn a little bit about clay. And then, and, and then people kind of contribute, the students contribute uh, with whatever they feel like their areas of expertise are. And um, so I think, I think it's, it's been working really well. At the university though, I teach um, digital 3D practices as um, parts of various classes. And then this coming year, it's gonna have its own class. So we are gonna do laser cutting. Usually we do laser cutting and 3D printing and, and a number of different things. Um, and um, I, I did notice that a big um, chunk of that class is the teaching of the, the CAD and the students sometimes struggling with the CAD, but uh, the learning curve is such that it is very, very difficult to get started if you have never like seen that three-dimensional workspace because it's hard to get yourself oriented in that. But once that becomes familiar, the, I think the students at this point are quite familiar with the just kind of digital environments and, and how the interfaces work. So I think for them, it's a lot easier than it, it you know, that I remember myself learning the same thing. Yeah, but not one, quite as overwhelming. One last thing I wanted to say that that I, I uh, ABM, like, I think you are just an amazing instructor bringing it to your classroom and, you know, finding ways yeah. for the students to explore it in, in small ways and big ways. Um, one thing that, that we wanted to explore and then have explored just in a tiny bit, and I, I thought that was something that the students really enjoyed, it was VR. Uh, we, we use VR as a way of creating um, the digital models uh, that oh, yeah. the Google blocks is an, the easiest way of doing that. The students really loved being in the, in the VR space and moving their bodies and, you know, creating volumes that way. And, um, and it just gave me an opportunity, even if we did simple forms, it gave me an opportunity to like smash those together in the slicer. Here is again, like how multi mm -hmm. the process can become. And then we were able to see what the slicer can do and then print out a variety of forms based on those simple things that they created in VR. So there are lots of, lots of, I think in technology, there's lots of things that are like feeding to each other. And there is never an obvious path of like, how do you do this? How do you do that? But if you know a few tools, uh, they kind of uh, tend to fall into places or like into their own place and, and build up a process. Yes. God, there's, there's so much interesting stuff to talk about here and I wish we had more time because in I, I I'm hearing several different things on that number from one end you've got these creative people that might 
love the ceramic side of it and like you said working with the wheel but they're intimidated by the more technical aspects of CAD and 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 working with some of the tooling and that sort of thing but then I can also see and and by the way that VR uh, approach is is brilliant of of that's a much less intimidating way where you can, and there's so many great apps. Like as you, now that I think of that VR, there's some great VR apps for three-dimensional, you know, painting and modeling that can be so much easier and more intuitive than learning something like Fusion 360 to begin with. But then I also think about it from the other side. I, I'm guessing that there are a lot of technical people that maybe never would have gotten into ceramics, but might really come up with some brilliant stuff with 3D printed ceramics because they they maybe have some 3D modeling skills and that sort of thing, but might not have had any interest in getting on a, a wheel or something like that. So I, I could see opportunities from both sides. Yeah, and there are so many examples of architects and architecture students are thinking of, you know, like entire buildings that can be printed. And, and and that's like, what I wanted to go yeah, to next. We've So I know like we're running, we're running, things. Yeah, yeah, we're running out of time, but I've got to talk about this a little bit because this is something that my wife and I are both fascinated with is 3D printed housing. Um, we had a uh, company, Mighty Buildings, on some time back as a guest on 3D Nerves Untethered, and they're doing some amazing work and have just started building 3D printed communities and, you know, net zero, uh, it, it, you know, emissions and all sorts of just amazing work. And um but everyone 3D printing buildings is pretty much building, you know, flat walls, just plain kind of box structures. They might have some curves or something. But when I think about taking your kind of work, Tamiya, and incorporating some of that, some of the mathematical design principles and things like that, and think about incorporating that into the walls of a, a 3D printed structure, that could be amazing. That could be, and it would work, right? There's no reason that it's just basically bigger extruders, right? That are extruding it, yeah. you know, cement and things like that. So yeah, you could apply it, some of the it same principles. It, it definitely would extend the build time, you know, like yeah. something, something like this piece behind me takes about six hours. Sure, sure. Yeah. But, oh gosh, I, I, if I was 3D printing a home for myself and I had the option of, of printing textures or designs into the walls that seems like a really amazing opportunity i have not seen anyone doing that yet anyway this is amazing and i like i said i wish we had more time because i could spend all evening talking to you too you've both done such amazing work and i love that you're both bringing this to uh, an educational environment to share it with others and help others do this kind of work because as, as you both know, it's you're always going to be surprised at the amazing things your students are, are going to be able to do with this. And it's, it's always wonderful. Um, I want to talk really quickly before we wrap up about those who might be interested in getting involved with this. Obviously, most people don't have this equipment, um, but it's not out of reach, right? I mean, both of you managed to get yourselves a, a ceramic 3D printer. And this is, I, I will mention, of course, that 3D Universe does offer these. We're a 3D potter partner and reseller. And so you can head on over to our website at shop3duniverse.com and check out all the different models that they have. And you'll see that they're, they're fairly affordable, actually, um, for a 3D printer for with these kinds of capabilities. But then you know are you going to get a, a, a 3d printer and a, a kiln and you know it's there's a lot of gear if you want to do the whole yeah. thing so one option is of course you know if, if you're in that position where you can buy all the stuff good for you go for it but um you know myself when i evaluated this i got the the, the ceramic printer the 3d uh, potter machine but then i i found a local uh ceramic studio that you know, rents out their, their kiln time. And I, I just use that when I need to fire something. So that's an option to keep those costs down. Yeah. Um, and then for somebody that maybe doesn't even, you know, isn't ready to make the investment into the printer itself, I, I think of folks like, like both of you, you know, if you have access to a studio like Slip Rabbit or a, a, a university that you might be associated with or a school that might be in your neighborhood that might have programs available, ABM, I don't know, do you, does your school ever do anything outside of like for your own students? Do they ever have like night programs for uh, the community or anything like that around ceramics? No, not, not at my school, not at the moment, but I know like, yeah. I know uh, here where I live in the Bay Area, like San Jose State University has a 3D printer. Uh, exactly. A lot of the universities believe, are getting them. Yeah, I believe the there's also, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I believe there's like a maker space uh, as well in the city. So there's, yeah. there's opportunities out there. Yeah, so you're gonna you're gonna want to look around. There's more and more of those maker spaces popping up in communities around the country, and yeah. uh, you're gonna start seeing these ceramic printers. I think more and more mm -hmm. in those because of of people like you sharing all the amazing things you can do with it. 
Absolutely, um, so it doesn't take that much space. Um, that uh, the, the the printer needs a, a dedicated table, but outside of that, there's a little bit of prep space needed, and one needs to be mindful of, of clay being like small particles and dust, um, so right. that they wouldn't put it in their living and sleeping environments. But um, but other than that, is really the kiln is is absolutely. Um, solvable situation and it's probably mm -hmm. better for glazing to go actually to a ceramic studio yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. The, the process most of the process is making the file and printing and you know doing the alteration so it's it, it can be done and a lot of people i've been seeing a lot of people doing it um in the past two years yeah and especially with the help of like the book that you published which is just amazing um which again, slipperabbit.org slash book. Uh, that's an amazing resource for people that want to get started and learn that whole process and workflow. Um, that's a great place to go and, and, and read more. Um, speaking of reading more and learning more, let's talk about that a little bit. If people want to go and see your work and learn more and follow your work, uh, ABM, what are the websites and things that people can go to to check you out? And we'll share these um, as links as well. Yeah, I think at the moment, just uh, follow me on Instagram. It's ABM dot alvarez and then uh, i need to update my website but normally it'll be posted on instagram so uh, excellent start there abm dot alvarez on yeah. instagram and we'll share that uh link with the recording and to me how about you yeah the the studio also has a, an instagram account it's slip rabbit studio on instagram um and yeah please follow follow us that it's a uh, really unfiltered we put up um uh, several times a week about what's going on in the studio what are the new pieces they really are uh, not photographed for presentation they photographed as they are there is a lot of process um, videos of showing the printer working and then the studio has the website it's sleeprabbit.org uh, there's a lot of great resource. You can find out about our programs and uh, how to uh, kind of like get in touch and how to collaborate. I do have to say because of the pandemic, we are still kind of like in a, in a situation of, of very tight uh, control and not really, not really being back to the public, um, uh, interfacing with the public as much. And then my artwork is on my personal website, Timia Tihani dot com and um the all the sculptures installations and the, the interactions that we talked about today are going to be there excellent and uh, tell us again about the there was a uh, an exhibition that you have coming up in january what is that yes i'm gonna have a show with sylvia tur who is a, a fellow artist here in seattle we are creating an installation of all new work for the bellevue art museum based on the idea of lives compartmentalized um sort of during the pandemic and and um kind of like as as both of us are immigrants to this country of like how do you how do you carry um your former life and things with you from one um, environment to another, which we thought would be just very relevant to hmm. people, a lot of people here. Indeed. So there's going to be new sculptures. I uh, will be updating the website for those of us who are not in the Pacific Northwest. But if people are in the Pacific Northwest, then the show is going to be up from January to May in the Bellevue Arts Museum. January, May, January to May 2022. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on uh, that upcoming event and um, very timely. I, I have to say that'll, that'll be wonderful. Um, thank you both again so much. This has been a, a really interesting discussion and I look forward to having both of you back so we can hear more as, as things start to return to normal and you get folks back into the studio to me and maybe we start to incorporate things more into the classroom. We got to have you back and hear more about how things are going with this. Thank you so much for joining and sharing your work today, both of you. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Thank you for the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for having us. Of course. And thank you all for watching. We will uh, have another episode coming up in a couple of weeks. So check out 3duniverse. Uh, sorry, 3duniverseuntethered.com for those episodes and details. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.